Praise the Lord. So glad that you are in the house of the Lord. What an interesting story. It's true. 25 years ago, my wife and I, we had two kids at that time, and we were in charge of 11 states in our union of youth pastoring, over 100 churches, and uh, Fresno, California. And we were looking into Fresno, and one thing led to another, and, and uh, had I come 25 years ago, I probably, I told the first service, I would have been a Jonah in his boat. Because back in Chicago, we were able, God has blessed my wife and I in the ministry there to build a ministry that's reaching girls who are being trafficked, boys who are being homeless in Chicago. We opened up shelters and uh, farms that we own to the glory. Just like what you're doing here in Fresno, California, we were doing it in Chicago. We just didn't know that 25 years later, we would cross paths. So pastor, I would say it's a divine connection. A divine connection in the world. Amen. Well, let me add to this. If this is your first time visiting Cornerstone and you're looking for the church, stop looking. This is a good church. This is a good church. Some great pastor. How many love their pastor? Come on, give it up for our pastor. Come on, give it up. Come on, this is amazing, amazing. And uh, if this is your first time, we just want to welcome you. If this is your third time, welcome here to Cornerstone. If you're visiting with your wife because it's Resurrection Sunday, I'm glad you came. I'm glad you came with your family. Uh, my brothers, if you're here and normally you don't come, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. May you open your heart to the Word of God. May the seed, the seed uh, be placed in your heart today. And if you are a member of Cornerstone, uh, welcome. You're part of a great ministry. This church, it's, uh, during the pandemic, you guys were saying, we're going to continue to worship the Lord no matter what happens. We're going to worship the Lord. And so I, I applaud you all in the, in the midst of a pandemic. And I know, listen to me, I know that COVID is real. I didn't say this in the first service. My mother died from COVID on May 9, 2020. And so I know COVID is real, but I also know that God is real and that I am not to operate in fear. And I tell my people back in Chicago, I said, hey, we're made out of dirt. Keep things into perspective. We're made out of dirt. And disease has been around for thousands of years. Wear three masks. I don't care. Bring a whole bottle of hand sanitizer. But whatever you got to do, get to church. Get to church and worship the Lord. Amen? I'm really an honor. My wife and I, we're honored, uh, Pastor Jim and Cindy, that we would take a pulpit during Resurrection Sunday. I just, you know, he's, we were going to Canada, and, uh, and this opened up. And so just to be here and to meet you all, it's just an honor. Motorcycle ministry. I have a motorcycle in Chicago, 1100 Shadow. I usually rent a, a fat boy, Harley, to drive uh, during my trips. And so when I see the motorcycle, I'm thinking, oh, man, this is like Chicago. My word. Hey, let me show you a, a, a picture of my family. Let me start with my wife, my beautiful wife, Elizabeth. This is my lovely wife. Here she is, babe. Stand up. Now, I love, I love the last service. This is the last service. Because after this, there's not another service. Which means I can preach for a long time. Four people over here, six over here, eight over here. Elizabeth and I, we've been married for 32 years. When she was, when she was 12 years old, I was 14. I had my eyes on her. I went visiting the church for the first time, and I saw her, and I said, hmm. Obviously, it was kid stuff. We didn't date until she was 17, and I was 19 years old. We started dating and dated for five years in, in the local church there, and you'll hear a little bit more about it during my sermon, but uh, Elizabeth's a, a worship leader for over 30 years, led our worship in Chicago, and uh, 
director, director of our women's ministry, teacher, and so forth, and the Lord has blessed, and it's just a joy to just travel with my wife and, and be a part of it. So thank you, Elizabeth. I bless you in Jesus' name. Elizabeth and I, we have uh, three children. Let me show you my tribe. This is my tribe. So this is uh, the two girls that are sitting down. The two girls that are sitting down is uh, the one on the right is uh, where your left would be Alex, Alexandria. She's the oldest one. She's the worship leader today. My wife passed on the baton to her, and uh, she leads the worship in Chicago. And then my daughter, the other one is Jasenia. She is a, a minister with her husband in the Assemblies of God, and they lead Master's Commission. And then my son and his wife, they're involved in the ministry there in Chicago. All my kids are married, and they're out of the house. Glory to God in the highest. <laughs> Yes, yes. I'm not this Hispanic father that wants their kids to stay. No, que se largan. You got to go, you got to go, you got to go. In Jesus' name. Elizabeth and I were grandparents. Let me show you some pictures. Let me show you this other picture. Look at this picture. This, kid, this picture tells you a lot. Right? I mean, this picture, I was telling the photographer, for the love of God, just take the picture. Take the picture. Look at them. Look at these kids, my grandchildren. They're just clueless. Clueless. One is crying. The other one's trying to get in. The other one's playing with her face. And Anyway, let me show you um, uh, Charlie. This is Charlie Grace. Charlie Grace. Now, I didn't say this in the first service because I love, I love the last service because I have more time. Come on now. When mommy, when mommy was alive, when my mother was alive, I went to her and I said, Mommy, I got my first granddaughter, and mommy's like, what's her name? I said, Charlie. She said, Charlie? Isn't that a boy's name? I said, mommy, today the names are interchangeable. You, you got to move on, mommy. You got to move on in Jesus' name. <laughs> so this is Charlie Grace. Let me show you another picture of what Charlie was doing during the rioting in Chicago. She was giving donuts to the police officers, loving on them. <laughs> this is what we taught our daughter. This is what we taught our daughter, and my daughter is passing it on. Our daughter is passing it on to her daughter, that as a church of Jesus Christ, that we are to speak prophetically into the situation. So let me show you my second granddaughter. This is Reagan. Reagan lives, so I go to my mother, and I say, Mommy, I have my second granddaughter. She says, what's her name? I said, Reagan. She said, Reagan? Isn't that a president's name? I said, Mommy, for the love of God, we got to move forward. You got to move forward. So this is Reagan Liv Hextrom. Uh, let me show you our first grandson. This is uh, James Anthony. James Anthony, he's going to be a piano player and a golfer like his daddy, like his father. Let me show you Dono, Donovan. This is Dono. This is Reagan's little brother. What a creep. Just a, just a joy, Dono. Every time I call Dono FaceTime, he's always asking for his mama. Where's mama? Where's mama? He wants to talk to Elizabeth. Here is um, our last one. This is Alea Sky. This is my son's daughter, and she's nine months there, and we are, how many grandparents do we have in the house? Yes. Beautiful ministry. My only question to God was, Lord, why didn't you give us the grandchildren first and then kept the kids? Amen. But Elizabeth and I, look at me, we're living, we are living in the more of God. Look at me. Do not settle for less when God has ordained more for your life. He has more for you. Your daddy may not have a plan for you. Your mother didn't have a plan for you. But God says, I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, verse 1 through 7. I'm old-fashioned like that. Thanks, Nate. Come on, give it up for Nate, man. He's doing a great job. I love to see family involved in ministry. Brings me great joy just to see the family involved in ministry. Luke chapter 24, verse 1 through 7. I won't preach long today. Maybe a good hour and a half. 
share your bread with somebody, you, someone that she doesn't have the Bible on their cell phone or whatever, share your bread. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. Verse 2. And they found the stone, what? Come on, what? Rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not, what? Here. But he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day. And on the third day, rise. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today here in Fresno, California. You're the God of I Am. Before we got here, you were already here. And there are some folks here today that need to hear a word. They need to come out of your, their dead situation. May they come to life today. May they experience the resurrected Savior today. May they leave out of here different, provoked, disturbed. So I pray right now, Holy Spirit, have your way. Come on, church, just tell them, have your way. Have your way in my life. Have your way in my marriage. Have your way in the life of my children. Have your way, God. Have your way. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. If you're taking notes, I've entitled this sermon, This Changes Everything. The resurrection of Jesus Christ for me changes everything, y'all. It changes everything. Because I truly believe that knowing Jesus is the most important thing that's ever happened to me being raised in Chicago, in the hood, with no father, destined for destruction, alcoholic family, failed third grade because I couldn't read or write. Coming to know Jesus Christ changed everything for me. And there are people and events that shape our culture and change how we live our daily lives, for sure. Over the past 100 years, we have witnessed some of the most profound changes in human history. World War I, World War II, specifically the attack on Pearl Harbor. 9-11 changed us. Even the way we go to the airport today, through TSA and all that, all that was because of 9-11. The civil rights movement. These are events that have changed the way you and I Look at life today. COVID-19 has changed a lot of things. Inventions, computer, microwave ovens, the internet, the cell phone. How many remember the rotary phone? The one... Yeah, these kids don't know anything about that. Back in the day, those were the phones. It took you a while to put all nine digits, but it... it I'm not trying to tell you this morning is that there have been changes. Events have caused change. What about people? People have caused change. Abraham Lincoln, the Emancipation of Proclamation, Mother Teresa, the care for those who were lepers, Dr. King, in his speech at the Lincoln Memorial, I have a dream, he said. These are people who have caused change in our culture. Over all the events that have ever occurred, over all the people who have ever roamed the face of the earth, in the history of the world, Jesus Christ had the most profound impact of humanity, period. Period. As a matter of fact, y'all, the fact that Jesus defeated death changes everything. Some people might live good lives. They do good things. Some might build up the economy. Some people write books. Some people give their lives to the poor. Some people create new technology. They have good wisdom in their books. But nobody, nobody has ever changed the world like Jesus did. 
and accomplishing the resurrection on the third day, y'all, this changes everything. He could have done all the miracles in the book of Luke and the Gospels. He could have raised Lazarus from the dead. All these things. He could have died on the cross on Good Friday. But the fact that he rose from the dead, my friends, that's a game changer. That's a game changer. I'm trying to tell you here this morning that there are people in the Bible, people like you and I, ordinary people who have found Jesus, who their lives were changed forevermore. You've got Saul, Saul whose name was changed to the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. His life was changed one day as he was walking down the road of Damascus, and his, and his an encounter with Jesus changed his life. Barabbas, Barabbas on the night that Jesus was going to be crucified, and they were going to take him into prison, they exchanged. Barabbas was sanctioned. He was set to die. But on that day, there was a substitute. And I don't know about you, but I like to imagine that while the guards were letting Barabbas go and they were bringing Jesus, that their eyes touched. And that Jesus looked at Barabbas and said, bro, this is why I came, to set you free. This is why I came, to set you free. I came so that I can die on the wood, not you. People's lives were changing their body. What about the 10 lepers, y'all? I love the story of the 10 lepers. Why do I love the story? It's because Jesus healed 10 lepers, 10 men who had leprosy, and then only one came back. One came back and said, wait a minute, I got to go back to him. My skin was falling apart, and, but my, now I'm healed. I got to go back and say thank you to him. So he goes back to Jesus, and he, and he goes to Jesus and says, hey, before you leave, I want to thank you. And Jesus said, Jesus said, hey, wasn't it 10 of you all? You know what that tells me? That he was counting. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. And he's counting today. How many people are here today? I saved you. I talked to you. I sent my messenger to give you a word. I saw you. I can heal your body. I can transform your life. I'm counting. One, two, three. You were at church at Resurrection Sunday. And then, and then Jesus was saying, weren't there ten of you and only one had the audacity to come back and to say thank you? Your life will change forever. And that day, y'all, that day his life changed forever. I'm just trying to tell you that when you meet the Savior, you're never the same. Okay, so you're not impressed. You're not impressed with this. And here's one thing I told the first service. I got to tell you, you cannot dispute the existence of Jesus. You can't do that. It's in the history books. It's in the Jewish antiquities. Josephus, he writes about it, and he's not even a Christian. So the fact that Jesus existed, you cannot argue that. You may argue that he's the son of God. I'm not sure about the son of God. But the fact that he was on planet Earth... That's undisputable. But let me just give you a little bit of history. I already told you. Now, pastor said I can come down. Because back in Chicago, I would come down to the church. I would preach five services, and I would slap people. <laughs> Don't worry. I won't slap you. I won't slap you. So here I am, Puerto Rican kid with no father, no Jesus, destined for destruction. This is my story. My story is no different than yours. Some of you all can share stories. And, and I get it. And, and my story, my testimony does not change people's lives. Only the gospel. But definitely it enhances, it helps it. So there I am, the youngest of six, five brothers, one sister. My father abandoned me when I was eight years old. Left Chicago with my mother, a single mom with six kids. Living off the government. Failed third grade because he couldn't read or write. But in the midst of all that, mess and gangs and riots in Chicago and gangs and fighting against the police department. All that I'm living, God in his calendar, he said, okay, Choco, I'm going to send you to a church at the age of 14 years old. So at the age of 14 years old, I get a summer job. I get a summer job in the city of Chicago. I was hired to clean streets in the city of Chicago, 14 years old. 
And there I am, I go to the local church, 1665 North Mozart, and there I am with the address, and I come and it's a Pentecostal church. Assembly of God. Now I was raised in Catholicism. As a Hispanic, we just don't break rank. I don't know how it is in other cultures, but as Hispanics, when you're raised in Catholicism, you stay there. So there I am, 1665 North Mozart. I walked into the church and I said, my name is Rafredo de Jesus. I'm here to clean streets. And the supervisor said, oh, you're not going to clean streets. You're going to do VBS, vocational Bible school, children's ministry. I said, I don't care if I have to do VBS. Do I get a check? I said, my mother is a single mom and we need check. They said, you're going to get paid. So I started going to that church, that Pentecostal church. And every day I would come, I would sit in the back of the church while the young people would come and they would pray at the altar. 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds coming praying at the altar. They would be praying and I would come every day, June, July. By August of that year, I remember going to the supervisor. I said, hey, what are these young people doing up here? He says, they're praying. They're praying to Jesus. He says, well, Fredo, do you want to meet Jesus? I said, I would. I'd like to meet him. Where is he at? He calls the young people, the supervisor. He calls the young people. And they says, the supervisor said, make a circle. And the young people made a circle. And then he says, Rafredo, get in the middle of the circle. I said, no. Now let me help you out here in Fresno, California. In the hood, you never get in the middle of anything. This is called a beat down. Heads up, heads up. I want to give you help. My brother was a leader of a gang in Chicago, and they would beat up people for three to five minutes if they want to join his gang. So I saw this. I'm like, I'm not going to do this. For that, I can join my brother's gang. And then the supervisor said, close your eyes. And I said, I ain't closing my eyes. I said, the first guy that hits me, I'm going to hit him back. So the young people look at me. They started praying. They started praying. I closed one eye. I closed the other eye. And then I said the most simplest prayer on planet earth. I said, God, if you exist, change my life. Change my life. And from there, I started attending that local church. I felt like something happened. I couldn't explain it to you. I thought maybe the young people put this powder on me or something. I, I had like this out of body experience going on. And I would go to church without knowing what was going on. It was a Pentecostal church. All I know is it was different. And that moment, it changed everything for me. That I started taking steps towards the right direction. Even I though I violated my family's rules. As a matter of fact, my godmother, who dedicated me in the Catholic church, she says, hey, if you continue going to that Christian church, I'm going to disown you. I said, give me a minute. You never gave me anything for Christmas. And Jesus gives me eternal life. I'm sticking with Jesus. I'm sticking with Jesus. Now, no doubt, 20 years later, she repented. 20 years later, she found out what God was doing in my life, and she repented. I get it. But this was my story. I started attending the church. I started going. And one day in November, that same year, the young people were going on a church van. They were going on a youth convention. That's why I'm so excited about this church building in the ministry of young people. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, invest in the next generation. We got to bring the next generation along with us. So I get in a van, y'all. I get in a van, this 14-year-old boy, Puerto Rico with no father. I get in a van. We get to Lansing, Michigan. We get to Lansing, Michigan. Preacher's preacher. He makes an altar call. I get saved again. How many people have gotten saved many times in their life? Tell the truth. Yep, 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 yep. Every time there's an altar call, I'm running. I'm running. I'm running. I need Jesus. I want to make sure he had every part of my heart. So watch me. Go with me to Lansing, Michigan. It's in a hotel. I go to the altar. I'm kneeling now. This is new for me. This is new. I've only been in church for five months. As I'm kneeling now, a lady comes. And she puts her hands on my shoulder and starts speaking in tongues. And it begins to prophesy. And she said these words to me. I've called you to be a great leader. Stay in my path. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. 
Now, now at 56, at 56, I know that that's a covenant that God made with Abraham. But at 14, I'm like, that's pretty cool. And I remember staying there for a little bit. I got up, went into the hotel, got into the elevator. What she said to me, it started resonating. Think, what is it all about? And as the doors were about to close, look at me. As the doors were about to close, a gentleman in a suit walks in. Boom. The doors close. And he turns towards me. And he said these words. Have you not heard? I've called you to be a great leader. Stay in my path. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. The Lord, he marked me. He marked me. He gave me a word that anytime I want to act like a knucklehead in high school, in football, anytime I want to do something that would deviate from that, that, those words at that hotel changed everything for me. How I was going to play football, how I was going to interact with people in the school, how I was going to just be a leader in my high school. Every time I think about what the lady said and the guy in the elevator, I'm just trying to tell you that God is in the business of using unusual people. And if you're here today and you fail third grade or you fail fifth grade or your daddy is an alcoholic and your mother is a prostitute, I'm here to tell you that you... It changes. It changes the moment you have an encounter with God. The moment you get a word from God. I was never the same again. The Lord began to change me. He began to lead me. He began to fill me with his Holy Spirit. He called me into ministry. And it literally changed everything for me. What I'm trying to say that everybody who encounters the resurrected Jesus never leaves the same. I say resurrected Jesus because you can believe that Jesus existed, that Jesus was a good man, that he loved people, that he could even believe, you can even believe that he died on the cross. But even that doesn't change everything for you. What changes everything is that Jesus resurrected from the dead. And because he defeated death, and if Jesus defeated death and lives forevermore through Jesus, we also will defeat death and live forevermore. <laughs> Woo! This is just my introduction. God have mercy. It matters, y'all. It matters how you view resurrection. It matters. It either entertains you or it propels you, propels you forward. The resurrection of Jesus Christ coming out of the tomb, it matters. That the tomb was empty and we must first recognize that the resurrection is God's fulfilling the requirements of a covenant relationship. He's always wanted to walk with you. He's always, that's why he preserved your life, y'all. It wasn't those drugs that say, God saved you. That car should have killed you, but you, you're alive today. It was God who preserved your life. I like this because Jesus appears to a woman. The first person he appears to is a woman, y'all. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw the two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, one at the foot, and they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Who was the first to see Jesus alive? A woman named Mary Magdalene. A woman who was considered an outcast, who was marginalized by the religious people. Yet she was given honor, y'all. She was given honor of having the first glimpse of the astounding revelation. Look at me, look at me. It matters how you view the resurrection. 
that God would allow Mary Magdalene, an outcast, to view the resurrected Lord. And I started thinking to myself, why did he appear to a woman first? Why not the disciples? Why not the dudes? God, I believe God wanted to redeem what was lost. He wanted to redeem what was lost. Jesus made sure to appear to a woman first because it means something, ladies. It means something. Mary went to the tomb, which is in the garden. Mary is in the garden crying. Here she stands as a symbol of humanity who have been disconnected from God, who cannot see Jesus. A picture of a woman who mourned the loss of life in the garden, looking for life among the dead. You're not going to find life in dead things. OMG. Some of you are trying to find life in a relationship, and that's been dead for a long time. That's another sermon. You're not going to find life in dead things. You're not going to find life in a job. You're not going to find life in a stimulus package. Jesus stands before her as he stands before you today as an answer to all of your confusion, all of your loss, and all of your fears, as an answer to all of your doubts. I started wondering, wow, a woman. In Genesis chapter 3, it was a woman who caused the first sin of disobedience. In John chapter 20, God reveals himself to a woman as to redeem that who was lost in another garden. Two women, Eve, Mary. Two gardeners, Adam, the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ. And he comes to redeem that which was lost because what God wanted most than anything was a relationship to walk with you in the coolness of the day. He wants to walk with you. In Am I talking to somebody here today? Am I talking to somebody here today? That's why the tomb is empty. It's empty. The tomb is empty. Not so that Jesus can come out. It's so that you can go in. No crea. No crea. You know, they never... That stone would have just blown. One word. That stone would have been broken to pieces. If the stone wasn't rolled away so that Jesus can come out, y'all, it's so that you can go in and see that it's empty and be ministered to because he wants to redeem that which was lost. He's a redeemer of time. He wants to walk with you. I like the story we find. When Jesus appears himself, and I'm paraphrasing, look it up when you get home. It's in Luke chapter 24. It's two disciples. It went something like this, and I'm paraphrasing. The two disciples were leaving Jerusalem to Emmaus, the town of Emmaus. And the Bible says that they travel seven miles, seven miles, y'all. And if you do, if you do 20-minute miles, it took them like an hour and 40 minutes to walk. Seven miles. Today in a car, you could do seven miles in seven minutes if you follow the law. <laughs> but here are the two. It went something like this. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask. It went something like this. These two disciples, they're leaving Jerusalem after a horrific weekend. And they're walking in the streets in the road. And they're like, wow, that was bloody, man. What happened to Jesus? They killed him in there. Unbelievable, and they're walking. They're having, their, they're having their conversation. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 24, Jesus appears to them. Yet they don't know it's Jesus, but now there's three of them walking on this road. Seven miles, two dudes talking. Come on, ladies, how many of you would like to walk seven miles with your husband to talk? You, you walk 10 feet, you can't even get a word. And here are two dudes walking, talking, and Jesus intercepts them, and he says, hey, what's going on? And the Bible says, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing, the Bible says, one of the guys says, 
What planet are you from, bro? You don't know what just happened in Jerusalem? Are you asleep? Are you from Mars? They killed Jesus. It was bloody. Really? Jesus is like, really? Tell me more. And there they are walking, seven miles. And when they get to the road of Emmaus, when they get to the town of Emmaus, I like this part. My wife referenced this earlier, that Jesus was a continue. He was going to continue. And he was going to leave the two guys. I love this because he didn't, he didn't like barge into their home and say, hey, you guys got to take me in. No, he, he went, he was ready to go forward until one of the guys says, hey, stay with us. Boy, does he want you to invite him. He wants you to invite him in. He wants you to come and say, would you come into my life? You could change everything for me. Jesus was ready to keep going forward, but one of them had the right mind and said, wait a minute, stay here with us. They still didn't know who he was. Why? Because it's not important what you see. What's important is what you hear. The Bible says that faith comes from hearing the word of God. Listen, I don't care if COVID takes your nose and COVID takes your mouth, but don't let them take your ear where you can hear the word of God, where you can worship the Lord. Let them take whatever they want to take. And Jesus reveals himself at the table. They get a word from him, the prophecies. He breaks bread with them. Lastly, Jesus appears to John in the island of Patmos. We find this in the book of Revelation. John is in the island of Patmos, and he's quarantined. Quarantined. Don't think you're the only one, that we're the only ones that have been quarantined. John has been quarantined. He's been quarantined. And the Bible says that John, in Revelation chapter 1, that while he says this, on the day of the Lord, on the day of the Lord, this is the day of the Lord, by the way. This is the day of the Lord. There's only two times in the Bible where it mentions the day of the Lord. One is the resurrection. Second is the one in Revelation. And John says, look at me. On the day of the Lord, I was in the spirit. Although he's been quarantined. Although he's been told, you're arrested. He was not in his flesh. He was not in his thoughts. He's not in his circumstances. He's not in what, what's going on in the world. No, he's in the spirit. For every believer that's here today, listen, I know we're going through some tragedies today in America, but you got to walk in the spirit. You got to be in the spirit. John was quarantined by himself, isolated. And if you want a revelation from God, we must be in the spirit, not in the flesh. John receives a vision of Jesus walking among the candles. Do you know what the candles represent? The candles represent you and I. It represents the church of Jesus Christ. In that moment, John feels so alone, so afraid for the future as Jesus is there with him. Just as he was with, with Mary. Just as he's with the two disciples walking in the road of Emmaus. Because he wants to walk with you. He longs to have a relationship with you. And there he is in the island of Patmos with John. Walking, talking, speaking life. And while John is receiving this vision, Jesus comes to John because the Bible says that John couldn't no more. He just prostrated himself. He couldn't no more. And then Jesus comes. Look at me. Jesus comes and puts his hand in his shoulder and says to John, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And this, if anything COVID has done, has created fear. I mean, there was a time when we used to, you know, especially Hispanic people, we just hug everybody. Now we're like, oh, cool, we're, we're I don't even know what to do. <laughs> and Jesus tells John, and he tells you this morning in Fresno, California, do not be afraid. He appears to us to encourage us. 
to make us feel better. He comes to walk with you in Fresno, California. He appears to you to change your life. He comes to deliver you, to save you from your sin, to give you eternal life. Although your father didn't have a plan and your mother didn't have a plan, God said in this calendar, you will be at Cornerstone Church and I'm gonna send my son. He's gonna come over there. He's gonna give you a message that you're gonna hear and you better respond. Let me, let me finish up, because this changes everything. The, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. It, it just changes the map. The healings, the miracles, and all that, the raising of Lazarus, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. Walking on water. But coming out of the tomb changes everything. So the Bible says that the disciples ran into the tomb. And they go in and they noticed they noticed where Jesus was laid, where he was laid, and there was the cloth that wrapped him. And there's another one that was about his face. And the Bible tells us how the cloth was put. Now, you and I, we've gone to restaurants. And when we eat at the table and we're done with our meal, most time people go like this, and they'll throw it right on top of the plate. As to say to the waiter or the waitress, I'm done ready for the dessert. The napkin like this, all punched up, put on the plate, says to everybody, I'm done. I'm going to move on. In this culture, when you read in the book of John how the napkin was put, it changes everything. As Americans, we don't read into it, but I'm going to take you there. When the disciples went in, y'all, and they found the cloth that wrapped Jesus' body, and they found this cloth that was around his face, like this. Because in this culture, if you're having dinner, if you're having dinner and there are servants there, there are servants, the servants are against the wall waiting, waiting for the people of the house to give them a sign. Not speaking, but body language. And if they would throw the napkin on top of the, the plate, you get it, the servants would come. And they take the plate away because their master is done. He doesn't have to say anything just by the pure action. But this particular cloth in John, the other gospels don't write about it, but this one does. So I started looking into it. And the Bible says that this cloth was folded like this. And in this culture, first century, it was folded and it was put right by the plate, not on top of it, right by the plate. And this, my friends, changes everything. Because this is talking to us. You know what this means in this culture? It means in this culture, when the owner of the house puts it and he folds it next to his plate, he's telling all the servants, don't touch this plate. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Oh my word, I wish somebody would understand. He says, I'm coming back. I'm coming to pick up my bride. I'm coming to pick up my church. They understood it. They understood it. You and I, we read it in John and we keep reading, but we don't stop. But now you need to stop because this changes everything about what you and I have heard for the last 30 years, 40 years about Jesus coming. He told you, I'm coming. I'm coming back. Let me finish here. Stand with me for a moment. Stand with me. Watch this. The Jewish custom, the dinner table, changes everything. There's just some things that we need to stop and read again and read again. What are you saying to me, Lord? Jesus was saying the opposite. He said, I'm leaving you a clue. Hey, Cornerstone, I'm leaving you a clue. He says, I'm not done. I will return. I will raise up my church and I will prepare a place for you. You will live with me for eternity. Relationship restored relationship restored in Genesis 3 it was damaged it was fractured in John 20 
relationship was restored. He just wants to, he just wants to walk. He's waiting for you to say, come with me. Come back to my house with me. Come back to my apartment. I need a savior. I'm lost. Had I not said yes at 14, had I not said yes to the Lord, this Puerto Rican kid, failed third grade, couldn't write, dysfunctional family, had I not said yes, there would be no New Life Covenant in Chicago. There would be no Dream Center in Chicago. There would be no medical clinic in Chicago. There would be no rescuing of young boys that are homeless in Chicago. We wouldn't have this in Chicago. But because one boy, one man, look at me, one man's obedience, one woman's obedience is connected. It's connected to so many destinies. Your obedience, understanding can wait, but obedience cannot. Your obedience is connected to your great-grandchild, and you don't even know this yet. I'm just trying to tell you, I'm living it. I said no at 14. Have I walked away and said, I'm not doing this? I would have never met Elizabeth. I never met my wife. I would never be here in Fresno. But because I'm here, it changes everything. Jesus changed everything. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, all over this place, those that are watching that line, all over this place, no one talking. My friends, you're here today. I'm not asking you to join Cornerstone Church. I'm not asking you to join the Assemblies of God. But I am asking you, would you join the family of God? He loves you so much. And he sent me to tell you he loves you. I didn't come for all of you all. I came for some of you that needed to hear this message. That if he can do it for this Puerto Rican kid, he can do it for me. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor Choco, pray for me. There's some things in my life that needs to change. And he can change it. I heard your message. I need Jesus to change it in my life. If that's you, lift your hands. I want to pray for you quickly all over this place. Hands are going up. Hands are going up. Hands are going up. Don't wait. Don't look at your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband. You, just lift your hands and say, I need to get things in order. I need things changed in my life. And I'm hearing that Jesus can change that. He can. And he will. Keep your hands up. And here's what I'm going to do. If you raised your hand all the way in the top to the front, if you raised your hand, I want you to get out of your seat and meet me right up front. I'll give you 30 seconds to do that as we sing softly. Come. He loves you. He loves you so much. 20 seconds. He loves you. 15 seconds. He loves you so much. Ten seconds. I'll wait for you. Five seconds. He loves you so much. I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. I want you to look at me for a moment. I'm no different than you. No different. What separates people is choices. That's all I'm saying. I'm no different. I'm no special. He loves you the same way he loved me and rescued me in Chicago. I'm no different. But what's going to separate you from your family is your yes. Yes. And that's what I said. Boy, if you can use this fun dysfunctional kid, you could use me, then go for it. And I stand before you to the glory of God. Failed third grade, couldn't read or write, with a doctorate in education. Only God can do that. Only God. And if he did it for me, y'all, who did do it for you? He's no respecter person. No nada diferente. He loves you so much. And on his calendar, on his calendar, you were designed to be here today. And I was designed to be here today. So that you can hear a message that can change everything for you. Not only you, 
but your children's children. Your children's children. Amen?